Hi, my name is Ken Levinson. I'm the executive director of the North American Passive House Network. I'm very happy to bring you this presentation, uh, this NAPHN Live presentation by Andrew Peel on keeping the engine warm, cold climate certified Passive House car dealership. It was hosted by Passive House Minnesota. And unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties at the beginning of the recording. So the normal lead in is not in the recording. So I am sliding this in now. It was on September 15th. And um, just mentioned Passive House Minnesota were great hosts of the event and their group of Minnesota based Passive House professionals and practitioners who aim to educate and promote the Passive House building energy standard. We certainly hope if you're in Minnesota and listening to this and interested that you become a member of Passive House Minnesota and by that, you become a member of NAPHN and the International Passive House Association. Or if you're anywhere in the United States, uh, do consider becoming a member of the uh, North American Passive House Network. And just a couple of brief words here before we get started with Andrew. Um, Andrew has his own company, Peel Passive House, which is a true leader in Passive House education and consultancy. Uh, providing as well certification services, training services. Um, his primary areas of expertise are in low carbon buildings and renewable energy. His professional and academic experience ranges from consultancy, program management, authoring technical and non-technical articles, course and lecture delivery, and technical research. So without further ado, I'm very happy to welcome Andrew Peel. Uh, yeah, so my name is Andrew Peel, um, and I'll be speaking about the world's first Passos certified car dealership. Uh, now, just a bit of background on the project. Uh, the client is the Scottsville Group. Uh, they are a uh, family-run business in business for over 50 years now, and uh, you know they're building their new uh, dealership for uh, their, their Subaru brand, and uh, basically it's a dealership plus repair shop. Um, the size is about 16,000 square feet. Uh, it's located in Red Deer, Alberta, which is, uh, you can see on the map here, nestled between Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, and it is a chilly place. Minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit is the design temperature. And that'll definitely, well, we'll get into some of the challenges there, but it, that definitely had a, a, an impact on, uh, on the design. In terms of the motivation for the project, so um, there was a clear alignment with uh, Subaru's environmental strategy. Um, they had actually developed the first zero landfill car factory in the US. Uh, and so uh, Subaru is a bit more of a progressive, progressive uh, car company in terms of uh, environmental uh, aspects. Um, and the owner uh, really saw this as a, a better way of constructing. So he wasn't totally, uh, you know, uh, he's not an environmentalist, um, but he definitely saw it as a better way. And given the, the family legacy, um, you know, this is a 50, it was 50 year anniversary actually a couple of years ago. So they felt this project dovetailed really nicely uh, with that. Uh, and he was naturally incentivized by you know, the very low uh, heating and cooling costs for the building. Uh, and he did feel like it, it could be a great or important statement for the industry and the country. A little bit of overview for, uh, for those who haven't worked in cold climates before. Uh, the cold temperatures uh, really uh, have a big impact on the design decisions. Every little decision uh, can actually matter in terms of the performance of the building. Uh, we see that air tightness has uh, a noticeably larger impact. Um, uh, aspects of um, equipment uh, start to show up that are challenging, so, uh, such as frost protection, uh, low humidity can be an issue. Uh, and also these design temperatures influence the actual functionality of equipment where, where some equipment just won't, won't operate at such low temperatures. Uh, we also had uh, an issue around product availability. Uh, we couldn't source locally manufactured cold climate products. Um, fortunately, the situation is gradually changing. So we're seeing more and more uh, come on the market, but certainly at the time, uh, very little, uh, if no products. Um, even in the EU market, uh, you know, we, we could source very few and uh, some of those companies wouldn't export to, to North America. Um, so very limited, even in the EU market, uh, what we had. Um, so really we had to walk a fine line uh, 
on different elements of the design to, to be able to meet the pass-fast targets. Uh, so uh, in terms of the building design, the fundamental design, because it's a two-story building, uh, it was uh, very much held or constrained by corporate image guidelines. You can see um, that it very much looks like a traditional car dealership, um, which is both good and bad. I mean, it's great that you know we can make an existing building uh, work, right? Um, uh, but it does uh, provide challenges uh, to actually making it work. Uh, very compact form, that's uh, the one benefit of these car dealerships. So we're, we're already working with that in our favor. Uh, unfortunately, we have highly glazed storefronts. So the showroom there, you can see, uh, very, you know, I think about 65% glazing and uh, it actually um, is west facing and that could not be moved, not even, you know, 10, 15 degrees. Um, we also have three different zones or occupancies, um, and a key uh, project parameter was that uh, Passive House could not disrupt or impact the customer service or the, the car repair service. Okay, uh, just a little overview of the layout of the building. We've got the showroom here, as you can see in the west uh, side. Uh, it's uh, two a double height, um, and that goes into the kind of circulation reception area, customer lounge. Uh, then we have some sales offices throughout here, uh, back into storage, part storage, and then here is the actual um, repair shop. And then here we have a drop zone where basically customers can bring off their uh, bring their cars in, drop them off, uh, say they're leaving them overnight to get it um, repaired or they might bring a car in from inclement weather to show a customer a car. On the second floor, we have that double height space above the showroom. Uh, we've got back office uh, rooms and then more storage. And then this is double height repair shop with a, a mezzanine above, um, so mainly uh, open space. Okay, um, I mean, this is a passive voice presentation, but I'm actually not gonna be spending a lot of time on the basic envelope, the, the opaque envelope is actually being a compact form, fairly straightforward. Um, you can see well, one thing to point out is um, the impressive R values, particularly in the roof, R120. Um, that, uh, you know, every, as I mentioned, every little bit helps in these cold climates. Um, and it was just a product as well of uh, the, the design of the building called for certain depth of trusses. And we figured, okay, well, we might as well, and actually we want to insulate them because it's a, a flat roof. So you want to make sure there's insulation fully, uh, uh, fully impacted into the, uh, into the roof space. Okay, uh, just a note about the walls. Um, we did use, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't convert this one. I thought I converted everything to, uh, to Imperial. Um, but uh, what's that? That's um, do quick math here um, for 12 inches or 11 inches, something like that of LSI, LSL lumber. Uh, this was dense packed with cellulose, uh, three inches of uh, rockboard 80 on the outside. And then we have a two by six uh, service cavity on the inside. So nice, nicely packed with insulation. Um, uh, now in terms of the West glazing, I mentioned it is south facing We've got a substantial amount of glazing. Um, I think this, the showroom's about 65% glazing. Um, and this was like, we, it, it's the street face. So we, we could not, we couldn't even, you know, turn it 15 degrees. Like it had to be exactly as it was oriented. Um, and Alberta is actually sunny. It's cold, but sunny. Uh, it's actually one of the sunniest, uh, some of these cities like Edmonton, Calgary, some of the sunniest cities in Canada. Uh, we actually compared this to typical German uh, location is about 50% more west radiation, even though it's at, at a more northern latitude. Um, and unfortunately, overhangs are not permitted because of the uh, the corporate guidelines. I mean, they, they do have limited benefit on such a, a high uh, facade, but even, you know, putting some in to, to mitigate it a bit, uh, that just uh, wasn't workable from the design. Um, we did look at um, uh, kind of shading from the surrounding area. It's very low density, flat um, city. And so there wasn't really anything in the, in the, the surrounding area that was, uh, you know, would provide any meaningful amount of shades or shading. Um, we also looked at some uh, tree planting, but we couldn't find a, uh, the right balance between uh, allowing sun in during the winter and blocking it out uh, during the summer. We just, it wouldn't work based on the site and, and trees and, and whatnot. 
Um, so that wasn't uh, an option for us. Uh, we looked at operable external blinds. Uh, this is a fairly common solution on passive house projects. Uh, unfortunately, this location was too windy. We looked at um, the, the wind gusts. Uh, and I mean, certainly not the windiest part, uh, place in Canada, but we're compared to some other major cities like Toronto and um, fairly, fairly windy. And um, one of the things to note is for, for such things uh, where, you know, devices that might be susceptible to wind, it's not so much the average wind that matters, but more the, the gust, um, you know, how, what's the kind of maximum speed, because that's, that's, that's where it's going to get damaged. Uh, they're also difficult to integrate with tall curtain walls, and that's what was used in the, uh, the showroom glazing. Uh, and there was a concern about aesthetics. Um, so really, com uh, you know, combining all those meant the external blinds were, were not an option either. Uh, we then looked at electro, uh, oh, sorry, I misspelled uh, this, electrochromic glazing. Um, for those who aren't familiar, this is where you put an electric, um, uh, connect this to like an electric circuit, and uh, you can adjust the tint of the glazing based on uh, control of the uh, um, electric, uh, uh, well, basic electric potential. So um, we'll go into kind of details of exactly how it works, but basically through uh, electric control, you can control the tint. And uh, this is a, a expensive. Uh, the, the joke is that it's reserved for the, the boss's corner office. Uh, we also had trouble with uh, getting the right solar characteristics for this project. So uh, you, you can see uh, one particular product we, we found, uh, it, the solar heat gain coefficient can actually range quite a bit, right? So from down to less than 10% up to 40%. At, um, you know, we needed to stretch this a bit higher uh, for the winter and the, um, the glazing U value wasn't low enough either. So that kind of combination meant that the glazing wasn't sufficient. You know, if we wanted um, both, both the energy performances as well as comfort, that, that wasn't sufficient. So uh, we, we basically exhausted uh, some of the most effective strategies. And so what we, we settled for was to use operable um, automated internal blinds um, that would respond to the sun and they could manually override that. So you can see that here in the, in the photo. And then the top span of windows, uh, we used insulated spanable pandrels, which uh, could balance out the heat loss with the solar gain. Um, so that was acceptable to the client. So that helped reduce some of the solar load. However, um, uh, you know, we, we couldn't, you know, we saw a lot of glazing, west facing, sunny. So we said, okay, well, we're gonna have to deal with that additional peak cooling load. And I'll, I'll get into that a bit more uh, in a bit. Uh, so in terms of the windows, um, so if anyone's worked, you know, on a, you know, certifying uh, to the PHI standard, we have this co window comfort requirement, uh, meaning you have to have your install window perform uh, to a certain uh, level in order to ensure comfort. And in the red deer, this happened to be uh, point one. I'm uh, sorry, I probably got the units wrong there. Uh, point one one. And uh, we could actually only find at the time one certified cold climate window that, uh, that was available um, that could be shipped to site. Um, and actually there were no cold climate certified curtain walls. Um, although in the interceding period, we now have a cold climate certified curtain wall, first in the world, and it happens to be built in Alberta. So uh, the, uh, unfortunately their, their team was uh, a bit late in, in the development to, to get incorporated into this project. Um, and so in the end, we did have to rely on, uh, on window heating. So to offset um, any issues with, with comfort, we did provide a heat source near the, the windows. Okay. And then uh, that's just reference the, the, the products we actually did use for the, uh, for the project. Okay, overhead doors. Uh, this is a challenge. Uh, um, it's not unique to this project. You know, there's been other projects that have used overhead doors. Um, but one of the, the key things was how many doors there were relative to the size. Uh, you know, sometimes you're dealing with like a one loading uh, a bay, uh, like a loading bay with one, one overhead door on a big building. Uh, this was not the case here. Uh, original design had seven uh, overhead doors, four to the drop zone, three to the repair shop, including one separate door just for the car wash. 
Uh, so we're like, well, this is a bit silly. Can we not um, change this? And so we actually proposed a design that would only have two, only require two. Client wasn't so happy with that. He felt it would affect the service. And so we settled on four, so about halfway in between. We were able to reduce the, uh, you know, you can see the uh, doors to two and the drops only two in the repair shop. And interestingly enough, um, when I visited the project um, a few months ago, um, he, uh, when we were walking around, the owner, uh, uh, Garrett, was uh, mentioning about, the, you know, our decision um, to go to go to four doors, and he said actually it worked out better because it opened up more parking on the spot. So that that wasn't foreseen, but in the end, the the, the revised design actually worked better uh, for them. So we got less heat loss as well as uh, another uh, more amenity in parking. And I think this this really highlights the a key thing and uh, uh, approach we take on our passwords projects, and we encourage all teams to take is really question design assumptions or design uh, standard design approaches right like it's a simple question like do you have to have seven doors instead of sourcing seven what turns out to be expensive airtight doors overhead doors which we'll, we'll talk about you know we, we had to uh, source um, uh, fewer of them so that you know made it more cost effective um, now our initial concern with the doors was actually uh, air um, air leakage during the uh, events where you have the door opening and closing well, it turned out that um, when we looked at this, um, there was a study done for uh, person doors, looking at how much heat loss uh, happens when you open and close a door. Um, and uh, it turned out that actually, based on the operation of these doors throughout the day, on a typical day, we weren't going to lose that much heat through the operation. So what became a greater concern was the standby losses, the you know, 23 point whatever hours per day that the doors are actually closed. Uh, and these doors were a substantial uh, percentage of the actual, you know, compared to like the transparent envelope, um, it, it's quite a bit. And unfortunately, conventional doors have almost no regard for, for air tightness. Um, we couldn't find any uh, doors rated uh, properly in North America. Um, and uh, so we, we had to look elsewhere. Um, and, and to note actually, our overall building air tightness target uh, to meet the space heating demand was 0.4 ACH. So I, we were actually targeting better than your, your standard 0.6 for new build passos. Um, and so, you know, that was going to be more challenging with these doors. Uh, so we had to look, because we couldn't find anything in North America, we had to look uh, to Europe. They actually have a, a system to rate the air tightness of such doors. And you know, there are different classifications with different levels of air tightness. Um, we could only locate one of class three, which I mean, it doesn't really mean anything, um, but you know, to, uh, if you're not familiar with the standard, but just to put it into context, uh, if we had four doors at class three, this would increase the overall uh, air tight, or increase the heat loss of air tightness by, um, by 10%. So um, yeah, so we had to really uh, work hard to, to make these work. Um, uh, luckily, we found a manufacturer that could export and um, could actually uh, show, demonstrate their performance. They had verified results. And uh, after a lot of hard work with the team, they ended up uh, getting right on target, 0.4. So with four overhead doors, you can still meet passive house. Uh, another aspect we looked at was internal heat gain. So early on, because of the, the nature of the repair shop with the, the car repair equipment, hoists, air compressors, all that, uh, we, you know, we had no idea what would, how, would, how much energy would be used and importantly, how much uh, heat the, the equipment would give off. And this is not, I mean, it's standard equipment. It's installed in car dealerships all the time, but they're not, it's not equipment that's typically rated because you know, it's not volume amounts of equipment. Um, and I, I'm not too familiar with it, um, you know, in terms of like how custom the machines are. Um, but uh, what we had to do is basically work with the client and how they use the equipment and estimate you know, their loads and ultimately how much, uh, how many internal heat gains they would, they would admit. Um, so we worked through, you know, basically piece of equipment by piece of equipment. Um, and, uh, and you can see we, we estimated about 55% of the internal heat gains was, was due to this equipment. 
Um, but I mean, that's, that's estimated, right? We didn't have, we, we couldn't point to any previous project with monitoring data or whatnot, you know, expected energy use of these, uh, of these machines. So in the end, it was, it was an estimate. Um, we also had a uh, temperature difference between the zones. So the, the client uh, had requirements to heat the showroom to 68. Um, whereas the, the, the repair shop in the drop zone was a bit cooler because uh, the people in the repair shop, the, the workers, they like it a bit cooler because they're, they're moving about uh, most of the day. And the drop zone, um, they, uh, they didn't need quite as warm as, as the showroom. Because again, you, you, they're generally moving about in that in that space. Uh, so we did have to consider the lo the heat loss between the zones because of this temperature difference. It's not a huge amount, um, but it's important to to keep uh, in uh, in mind in the in the balance. And uh, one thing that we didn't think about at the beginning was that we have big car engines that you know if they've been driven to site, you know somebody from say a half hour away driving and they drop their car off and it goes into the repair shop right away, well, you've got a big, uh, basically, heat uh, uh, source um, uh, uh, entering your, your building. Conversely, uh, the client does allow customers to drop off their cars overnight. So that could be just left in the parking lot. You know, if it's, uh, you know, minus, you know, 10, 15 degrees outside, uh, overnight, that car is going to be get you know the whole the all the metal all the components going to be really cold. So you're bringing in a big ice block into the space uh, at night as well. So we did uh you know as best we could in a, a rough en energy balance of you know car based on typical customer patterns of how they drop their cars off, and we actually reasoned that more or less that energy balance the, the energy flow is balanced out between the heat coming in and the heat being taken out uh, or, or sucked sucked into the car, coal cars. Um, and then we also had the car engines running during repairs. Um, so, you know, after they've repaired it, they may need to turn them on to test them. And the exhaust can actually reach up to 650 Fahrenheit. It's very hot. And uh, again, we needed to estimate this. Uh, so based on uh, input from the client, we estimated gains. Uh, and this was based on an estimate of, yeah, how much are they typically running per, per service? Um, but, you know, could be noticeably more if, if they were running longer. Okay, um, on terms of the mechanical electrical systems, so the ventilation, um, we did have a separate ERV for each space, uh, the showroom, the repair shop and the drop zone. And that was to ensure we didn't have any uh, cross contamination of uh, car fumes, um, and we had, you know, we had, uh, the we, we we looked at combining them, but the engineer was like, no, we we definitely want separation. Even though you know the ERVs we're using are are airtight, um, very little leakage. Uh, there's there's strict requirement there. Um, the uh, in terms of the car exhaust itself, if they're running a car inside, naturally you'd have a buildup of pollutants. So what they do is actually hook up a um, a long uh, tube tube to the um, uh, exhaust pipe and then uh, through a fan they just suck out the air uh, from the exhaust pipe uh, outside and then they have a makeup air uh, unit. We actually looked at um, connecting um, the makeup air through a hose to the front near the intake of the, uh, like the, the air intake uh, into the engine at the front. Uh, the uh, repair manager, repair shop manager was not happy because he's like, well, that's going to disrupt um, service. It's, you know, it's one thing to clip it onto the exhaust. They have a fairly easy method to doing that, but they didn't want to um, faff around with, with connecting a tube to the front. We thought we could avoid the heating the makeup air by, you know, injecting it into the, directly into the, or nearby the, the engine, but that wasn't going to go. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, high CFM rate per bay, you know, you've got six bays, 400 CFM per service bay. So that's a lot, you know, if all six bays are going at once, 2,400 CFM for a, you know, 1,400, sorry, 16,000 square foot building. Uh, that's a lot, you know, compared to the background rate, it's a lot. Um, now we were able to convince that the standard approach is to put a, um, all the, the, the tubes connected to one fan and just eject it outside. We were able to convince the engineer to just have a separate fan per bay. 
And so that, uh, you, know, you can see 83% reduction in our, our total uh, flow because what, oh, so one thing I forgot to explain is with the one fan, when you have one car go on and you need the one tube sucking, because it's one fan, all service bays would, would uh, exhaust at the same time. So even though you may only need 400 for one bay, you're actually running at 2,400. So we're able to reduce that um, down to just 400 at one time. Uh, but then just do an issue, issue with uh, drawing updates and communication with the contractor. Uh, they ended up installing, uh, connecting, you could see three of the fans together. So, you know, half of them, uh, we, we end up with two fans instead of six. So we end up increasing the heat loss again, uh, based on the uh, construction, how it was constructed. And luckily we, we could still manage that within our, our, our heat balance. Uh, we did also look at re heat recovery on this exhaust uh, for the makeup air. Uh, we looked at all sorts of stuff, uh, heat recovery unit, um, like a HRV. We looked at um, a, uh, like a tube in tube. We looked at heat pipe, all sorts of stuff. And in the end, no manufacturer would actually um, warranty their equipment for dealing with car exhaust. So we had no viable heat recovery. Uh, we also considered an earth tube or ground loop, like, like a glycol loop outside. Um, however, the 2400 CFM is a huge capacity. You know, it's basically, it's running intermittently, um, but it turns on a, a potentially a high capacity. And we need to size the system to deal with the, the max load, even if it, most of the time, that's not going to be happening. Um, and the average ground temperature in there is only 39 Fahrenheit. So there's actually not as much of a temperature uplift that we, we can get. Um, and there's also the danger of, of frost heave um, with the system. So that proved not viable as well. So we basically had to suck it up and deal with the extra heat loss. In terms of a heating cooling system, standard ducted VRF system with, with uh, the heat pumps uh, installed in the suspended ceiling. And they were, uh, they ducted the, the air to, the, uh, to each room. We did actually um, uh, propose to the engineers to use a residential model for this system um, instead of a more expensive commercial system. Uh, the engineer did express concern over longevity. Um, in our view, this equipment is going to be used much less frequently um, than a you know, typical uh, system. And uh, so we figured you know, it, it would last longer even if it's a residential model, um, but the you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't accept that. So we did go with the commercial unit in the end. Um, and unfortunately this uh, heat pump uh, system doesn't work at the winter design temperature, despite you know, some assurances from the manufacturer, engineers weren't confident, or confident in that. And so we ended up needing to have electric backup um, for all the heat pumps. And uh, as we'll see, the, the actual, uh, he, the, the, the system was well oversized. Um, and which meant then they also had to put electric backup for the size to meet the capacity of the heat pump system, which was much higher. So even the backup systems much higher. Um, so just a little note about heating uh, system capacity. Um, our calculations showed that uh, the engineers, what the engineers were calculating for the heating load was actually three times what um, we were estimating. Uh, and that was actually not even considering any of the gains inside. So if we, if we assume there were no gains, uh, they were still calculating three times as much. So I just want to give you a little insight here. So here's our PHPP calculation, like the standard calculation. Uh, here's if we take away all the gains, this is what the, the heating load would be. And the engineer, that's what they calculated. So three times as much. Um, now, we, we would have probably argued harder to downsize the equipment based on this. Um, however, when we looked at the cooling side, it was a bit of a different case. Um, and this is where we bring in that large west facing glazing uh, again, because uh, we looked at a different, different scenarios uh, to see you know, how, how we would estimate the, uh, the, the, the solar gains and the, the peak cooling load and what that, uh, how that would compare the engineer's calculations. And so we, we basically took our standard PHPP and we, we modified it to come up with an estimate for um, different scenarios. So if we, if we looked at our peak day with um, you know, more gains than usual, then maybe PHPP assumes, 
uh, we even looked at the peak day with like the worst amount of games, like all the equipment on, the most number of customers and staff they'd have at one time, uh, all the lights on. And then we took the peak uh, uh, three hour, worst, worst three hours of the day. So where we get the most sun coming from the west uh, side as well. And you can see that, you know, factor five difference in the, in the uh, heating load. And in the end, uh, it was actually that calculation was closer to the engineer's calculations. And so this was a case where we couldn't confidently or reasonably argue to downsize the equipment. And so it came back to the, the, the killer west uh, glazing that it just it put too much of a solar load on the building to be able to reduce the, uh, the system size. On the hot water side, uh, there are two uses. In the showroom, we had uh, hand washing and then in the little washrooms they had, this was supplied by a CO2 heat pump. Uh, we decided to install uh, the, the outdoor unit um, actually in the repair shop so that we get a bit of free cooling from that. Um, and then in the repair shop, uh, they actually mentioned a car wash. Well, they use hot water uh, it's not necessarily common for all cars, but it, as part of their standard service, they use hot water to wash the cars. And every car that's serviced gets a car wash. Uh, and it's quite a bit of uh, water. It's 530 gallons per day. Uh, you can see at 140 Fahrenheit. And the only option to keep up with this demand is actually an on-demand ga on gas heater. Um, any uh, regular heat pump system like these CO2 based uh, systems, it can't, it can't produce enough hot water fast enough to keep up with that demand. Um, and unfortunately this has a huge impact. Like it was more than a half of our normal passive house target, uh, you know, 19 kilo BTU primary energy renewable. Um, this was more than half of that did the hot water demand alone. This was uh, the only gas service on the, uh, in the building. So naturally we wanted to look at heat recovery options um, and it's actually a great candidate because it's a high volume, high temperature and frequent use, uh, which th that basically allows us to be able to recover, potentially recover quite a bit of the heat. Um, now we did, for anyone who's worked with drain water heat recovery devices, um, you normally you have like a, a pipe, a vertical pipe you install below the bathroom and the wastewater drops into the, the vertical unit and then the cold uh, tap water, cold water comes uh, and recovers heat from that uh, through that pipe and gets fed to the shower. Uh, there, there, there actually exist horizontal versions of that that you can install under showers. Um, and so they're recovered. They're not quite as efficient, but they, they still work well. Um, and we actually, uh, we found a manufacturer in Canada that uh, was at one point producing these. They stopped producing them because of uh, trade issues. We, we didn't get a clear, a really clear answer about that. Um, they were at the beginning uh, willing to create a custom unit, um, but then midway through they're like, no, we're not going to do that. I don't know if, you know, again, this, these trade issues kind of came into play. Um, so unfortunately, we, we, di we didn't have an option for that and we settled on basically taking a vertical unit, um, so one you would normally install vertically, and install it horizontally under the drain of the, uh, the hot water, the uh, uh, car wash bay, and, uh, and so we recovered heat there. Unfortunately, this reduces the efficiency quite a bit um, because you only get, basically you've got the water now traveling at the bottom, you don't get all the surface recovering heat. So you get some heat recovery, not ideal. Um, we'd certainly do it differently the, the next time, but this is kind of what we, we had available at the time. And then the little magic I mentioned uh, for those who were kind of on the call uh, right at the beginning was data um, kind of fresh off the, the, the press um, from the actual uh, building. So we've got utility data um, they provided it. We haven't gotten it broken down yet. They've just given the total annual utility bill. Uh, so that's like your uh, electricity, gas, sewer, water, all that you know, basically combined together. And he's given that for two other dealerships in their family of dealerships. So we have comparables as well, right? We're not comparing to some theoretical. Um, so these are, you know, similar buildings, different size, right? So small and large. Uh, so we get a nice comparison uh, and the, the, the time zone, like you can see time period for two of them, it's the same. 
So our actual project and the large dealership, the data is from the same period. Um, he didn't provide me, and I, I, I haven't had a chance to really dig into this about um, why we didn't have this last year's data uh, for the small dealership, uh, we, so, but he gave it the year before. Um, I'm not sure how the winter period changed, um, but I thought it would still be useful to, to compare. Um, and yeah, you can see here um, the savings. Uh, I've, I've normalized it to square foot because they are different sizes. So between 60 and 64% savings on their annual utility bill, so overall bill, um, based on um, uh, you know compared to their existing dealerships and again this is all a total utility bill and I wouldn't expect like the um, uh, the water the sewage that kind of stuff to actually change much it would, it would probably scale by the building right and so really this is indicative of uh, the energy savings from from passive house uh, and so technically the, the, the savings are more if you look at just the energy bills, right? Because uh, of course this is all, all the utility bills. Um, and then there you go, you, your cost per square foot. So we're really hoping now to get more detailed monthly data so we can start to do a bit more analysis. We don't have monitoring system. The client did not want to put a monitoring system in, unfortunately. Um, but we will, if we can get monthly data, we can start to at least uh, do some kind of rough calculations, look at like separating out potentially like hot water demand from space heating, things like that. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll be able to tell something about like the repair shop, um, you know, not, not in great detail, but you might be able to say, see something more with the monthly data. Um, yeah, so I thought that was really cool and just shows you, you know, even these cold climates, passive house, really does work and, and in a like, you know, uh, environment that, you know, and, and a new type of building that where it's not been done before. So uh, summarize, uh, really cold climates, uh, designing passwords in cold climate really demands everything you've got. Uh, simplified approach is critical. Um, we really, uh, you know, find engineers who are willing to explore options. I didn't really get too much into that, but it was a bit of a battle sometimes with the mechanical engineers to, to really push the envelope, so to speak. Um, we, we are de definitely in need even now, you know, a couple of years on uh, with uh, innovation in products for, for cold climates. Uh, I mean, this is nothing really uh, new thinking through the details early, um, but specific to this project, uh, you know, you want to estimate equipment and occupant loads early on so you can understand your internal heat gains and, and understand potential overall energy demand. Identify all energy flows. As I mentioned, we miss the car engines uh, or the, the heat brought in and taken out by, by cars dropped off. Uh, so you really have to take some time to think through that. Um, luckily, we're able to, to incorporate that. And yeah, not everything is predictable, as I said, with, for instance, with that, that energy flow, if, it's, if you're dealing with something for a new. So we, we, uh, we try to add a bit of buffer um, of safety for meeting our, our path source targets. And I'll end by saying that if you if you like a challenge, then design a passwise car dealership in a cold climate. And that is me for uh, presentation. So um, do we want to, I guess I, I can keep it shared uh, in case we want to reference slides. And uh, I guess we can, yeah, open it up for questions. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. You know, uh, real quick before we hit these four questions that are in chat, um, part of the, the NAFN conference this year, I know the, uh, I got a chance to hear the owner speak about these, about the project and the comparison um, between those other two car dealerships. Can you just give us a, a, just a quick summary of what the owner's impression was about the, the project and how the, how the people inside are, are liking uh, being in the building, I guess. Mm, great. Well, I mean, definitely what speaks volumes is uh, like his next car dealership. He's like, yeah, well, we'll take this and, and, you know, try to replicate it or, you know, take what we've learned from this. And so he, he'll, he'll do a pass for us again. Um, in terms of the feedback, uh, the anecdotal feedback we've, uh, we've heard, I, I mean, I've heard through the owner uh, from the staff, they love the environment. It's quiet. Uh, it's comfortable. Like they're just, they're not, they're not used to such an environment, but they really appreciate the environment. So, I mean, who knows, you know, you talk about the business case for this, you know, how do you, how do you put a, a number 
on on you know improved uh, uh, employee well-being, right? I mean, I don't know if he's tracking. I'd, lo I'd love to, you know, follow up in some time about like, you know, has that reduced the number of employee sick days or, you know, other other kind of measures you could see of, of the impact on the employees? Yeah, and one of the questions from Peter was also about the construction cost comparison. So I guess, you know, you showed the utility cost savings uh, what was that initial construction cost like? We don't have that from the owner. Um, uh, I'm not sure for like, I don't know if it's trade reasons or whatever, he hasn't um, hasn't revealed that to us. I think the estimate from the architect, uh, I, you know, I, don't quote me on this. I mean, I, I recall like kind of 600,000 in, uh, increase in budget, um, but I don't know, uh, I don't remember if that is. I mean, I think based on that, like the, you know, the, the kind of return on investment was great. I mean, it's you know, long-term ownership. Um, again, you know, what other factors are we not quantifying? Uh, but also, I'm not going to stand here and say this was the most cost-effective project. Like, there's definitely optimizations we can do that could, you know, further drive down the energy demand, but also just some of the solutions. One of the issues on the project, you know, I didn't get so much into the construction side of things, but um, just due to the nature of, uh, you know, architect scope and the contract type, like not all the detailing is worked out uh, early on as we all like to do in Passive House. Um, but, you know, the, and so the construction, like the, the um, uh, builder was left kind of trying to work out solutions and there was a lot of like time pressed solutions made. So some of the things we came up with and time pressure, like we're not cost optimized. So one, the, one simple example was the, the threshold to the overhead doors. Like we wanted something thermally broken. And I've got a, an image here of this, uh, where is it? It's very near the beginning. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, here. So this is uh, a thermal, you know, structural thermal uh, break, um, which th these pieces were thousands of dollars. Um, and you can detail this for you know factors less uh than that it's just you know how the project was going it was just like oh here's the option okay let's do it and then before you know it, it's like okay we've installed it like ah so yeah things like that we could definitely um optimize to reduce the cost um Let's see, one of the other questions here. I don't know if anyone actually wants to, to say their question in person. Feel free to jump in if you do. Um, the first question we have here is from Brad. And uh, he asked, if Subaru decides to go electric rather than ICE, will any building retrofits be needed? Uh, no, actually, this the system interestingly was designed like the the repair shop was designed to deal with diesel cars even though Subaru doesn't actually manufacture diesel but they service other types of cars um, and so it's it deals with you know uh, internal combustion engines if you switch to electric I'm not like uh, aware of any any uh, and I'm no expert but I wouldn't expect any uh, it being any more demanding if anything I would expect it to be less demanding on the building Let's see, and then Ken asked uh, about how much um, how much more enclosure thickness and expense would you have needed if you went to well the passive house minimum of 0. 0.6 uh, ACH. Um, I think we maxed out on the insulation on this one. Um, the I mean the ventilation just, rates. Hmm? Was that? So there's just no more benefit. Uh, the, no, I mean we're our, our 120 in the roof. Uh, it's filled like it, the, the joists they needed or the, yeah, the joists they needed, they're full. We needed to fill them for like uh, building moisture issues with a flat roof, right? Um, but like, you know, we'd have to increase the thickness of the joists, I mean, more, more cost. And there's like, you know, the roof and the heat loss was, you know, a small part. It was really in the end, the, the ventilation losses that were, um, you know, driving the the losses and you know there's only so much we can do by code or but by, by really by by prudent design like you know you're dealing with car exhaust you don't you don't want to mess around with that it's you know different than you know you know like a bathroom smell or something like that um, although you, you want to design 
system so that they're dealing with bathroom smells as well. But you definitely don't want to mess around with something where it's like, you know, there's a kind of major health or life safety uh, aspect. You know, you had such a very precise air tightness number. How did you manage to control that um, and actually get that exact number? What was the oversight like? Uh, great. The the builder, uh, actually the main one of the project managers, he, he comes from a design build background. So he was used to coming up with solutions like, you know, because he's he, he was at both words, um, his hand in both worlds of design and, and construction. So he was really good at, at coming up with creative solutions that we, you know, we just, because of scope we, that weren't, weren't developed during, during design. Um, and, you know, some, sometimes, and that's another cost op optimization point. Like, you know, there was definitely uh, opportunities for savings if, if they'd have been detailed properly. And like, I'm a big fan. I, you know, it's hard to convince clients sometimes of bringing, a construction manager, main contractor on board with the design team, you know, even if it's not the, the, the team that's going to build it, like, you know, you could tender that later separately, but having that cost and constructability feedback through the design is, is critical in my mind. Like you just, you, you, you spend 10, whatever X times more trying to figure it out on site. And it's, you know, many of us in the passers community, uh, you know, uh, you know, blow this horn, shoot this horn, but um, it's so it's so true. So, yeah, I mean, they, but they, anyways, going back to your question of the um, the quality control, they were on top of it and they were coming up with solutions to to make sure that um, uh, the building was built airtight. Okay. Um. See. Andrew asks, did you have to work with PHI on the window comfort criteria and bringing heat to the glazing? Uh, we did not because, I mean, we're, we're certifiers as well. We're very familiar with the requirements and coming up with solutions to addressing it. So it was really just working with the engineers to make sure we got a good, um, uh, good flow of, of uh, air, heated air uh, along the windows. And they, that, that didn't end up being, like they certified the building. It didn't end up being an issue. This uh, product you mentioned in Alberta, that there's a curtain wall system now in Alberta. Is it a certified product? It or? is. Yeah, by PHI. Uh, actually, at the Passers Canada Conference last year, they, they got their, they received their certificate. Um, yeah, it's called Glass Curtain with one S, uh, Alberta-based. It's a Calgary, Edmonton. I can't remember which city. And they, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had, I had questions like, could you even do that in a curtain wall system? And they, yeah. they proved they could, it's a, it's a fiberglass based system. Great. And uh, Ken has another question about what design changes would you recommend glazing orientation? Oh, well, orientation uh, <laughs> I'm like, well, that we we pushed hard, but no we we couldn't yeah. budge on that i think um if if we could um i I'd be interested that if we could find uh or even work with a uh one of those electrochromic glazing suppliers to to get the right specs for what we need for the project. They said afterward when I met one of the companies they're like oh we we'd work with you on finding a, a spec you know try to work, like make something work. So we, we probably didn't explore that as fully as we could. I mean, we, you know, we were also, you know, a lot of issues um, we were dealing with um, design challenges. So, you know, there's only so much effort we could put down one particular stream, um, but I'd explore that and, and look at um, the cost benefit versus uh, the system sizing, because, you know, we ended up having to put the full uh, system, the engineer wanted to spec in. Um, but if we could, we might be able to offset, uh, you know, it might be a cost neutral or uh, I'm interested in the, the cost benefit analysis of electrochromic glazing versus, uh, you know, downsizing of the, of the heating cooling system, especially in this kind of building. It, it might be different in like multifamily with a lot of small rooms, but like in a big open space like this, like, I mean, you know, you, I, I, I don't know if I have a, a photo on this slideshow, but they have a lot of duct work and the, the heat pump heads here, like a whole bunch of them. It's just like, it's, you know, it's excessive. If we, if we could reduce that cooling load, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be definitely be excessive. Um, so there's great, great opportunity there, I think. 
Yeah. And then the, 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 I'll just actually add to that, the drain water heat recovery. Um, we, we, um, we also found a product in the UK and it's actually a company that's been interested in bringing their products into North America uh, that has those horizontal shower type heat recovery devices that would be an ideal solution for the, the car wash. Yeah, great. Are you seeing any um, any positive developments in our North American market of, you know, overhead doors? Uh, sound, I believe you got those um, from overseas, right? Of more product that's actually being made here in Canada and the United States. We've not had a project since that's required an overhead door, so we haven't been on the active lookout. Um, I know um, some people have asked us about the, which doors were used on this project. Um, so we've given them that information. Uh, I don't know if that means they've looked and haven't found anything or they're just like, oh, if somebody's done this, let's find out what they've done or what they've used. So uh, definitely an area for innovation. I don't know, you know, one project like this, I mean, even if we had another car dealership, I don't know if that's going to like lure a manufacturer into making uh, making a better product. Um, uh, but we, you know, we'd certainly uh, engage in, in discussions with, with local manufacturers. You know, we, we like to use local products as much as possible. Um, and sometimes it takes, as we know, importing good products, uh, you know, much better products to show manufacturers, hey, this is what you should be making. Well, and I think one other final question here was just if you've been able to go to the site. I, I did visit it, yeah, when it was finished um, in, was it a Christmas? I'm already losing track. I think it was this Christmas. I was out, actually, my, my sister lives in Calgary. So uh, we had a sort of family visit out there and uh, I took her, I, well, took her, her kids, my mom. <laughs> we took a little family road trip out there and I uh, got to see the project um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's a great environment. Um, the, the noise, I mean, it's like you, like with any Passover's project, the noise, uh, the air quality. Um, I mean, I didn't get to talk to any staff. It was kind of a quiet period over Christmas. Um, but, and then just meeting the owner in person, like he's just excited about it. He loves it you know, really happy. It, it was a rocky road. I mean, there are times where, you know, I, I don't know if he was serious about not continuing to pursue it, but, you know, questioning us, like, what's going on, guys? Because we we're coming up against challenges. <laughs> and, you know, where, where's this money being spent, you know? <laughs> yeah, I just not, you know? Yeah, go on. On that, I mean, it just seems like you had so many obstacles. Like, mm -hmm. every way, which way you turned, it was like, oh, this is... A disaster this is wrong <laughs> this is the opposite of what we should be doing mm. like how much play and you have a double height space and you know it's like every cliche like wrong thing to do mm. uh you've got there and so how did i mean it just seems remarkable that you pulled it off but the yeah team pulled it off. the the team is perseverance i mean you, you do have to kind of you know you know, put your, and I'll put your foot down, but just like, you know, take a stand and say, we're going to make this happen. We're going to go the extra mile. Our budget was limited because often, you know, clients don't appreciate the effort that's required. You know, it's a similar story. And so you, we, you, that, and that's part, that's part of why we couldn't detail it properly during design. It's like, look, we, we just don't, and you, you know, you, you go the extra mile, but there's, there's only so much you can go and uh you know the architect was good you know he had more direct contact with the client uh lucas armstrong from cover architecture uh really helped to handhold the client to keep them engaged right and again i i don't know if he was ever seriously saying screw it but you know there are times where he was you know not not as happy <laughs> <laughs> and you you know we, we navigate that and i think it's just you know staying committed through the the rough patches and in the end i think you know, when they see your commitment and in the end, when, like when you, when you succeed and you get this great product, like they're, they're happy. Yeah. Falls by the so, wayside. Right. Can you speak to the um, wall section too? I think Peter Schmelzer had a, was wondering, um, I don't know if you, you didn't show an actual wall section. Uh, no, I guess not. Like the, I mean, we've got this, you know, these timber uh, glue lamb beams Just for the curtain wall. Describe um, the buildup of the opaque wall. Yeah, it's basically. I think that's what Peter's asking about. Peter, are you there? Or? 
maybe he's gone and we don't need to answer the question. No, I'm here, just muted. Yeah, I was wondering about the wall. <laughs> there you looks are. like a standard looks like a standard stud wall with uh, Z furring and rock wall on it. Is that right? The uh, yeah, so we've got um, exactly the you know these. Uh, so you know, it's quite thick, so we don't have our standard stub rate engineered lumber here. And then yeah, all filled with cellulose. And then you've got uh, three inches of rock board, uh, rock yeah, rock board eighty. Uh, to help cut the thermal bridging, um, and then uh, yeah, two by six service cavity. Which uh, no, that uh, actually I don't remember if that was insulated or not. I, uh, I'd have to double check on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the unique thing is not this type of wall. It's the fact that a car dealership did it in timber. Like it's usually steel. So I mean, that's that's another nice. Thing. You know, we've got the passive element. And in terms of embodied carbon, uh, you know, the, the wood plus the cellulose, I mean, cellulose in the roof. We don't have like a flat roof with PIR as we usually do. Um, and the only, I guess, foam would be the EPS in the floor. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if they used a bit of spray foam around the windows or, or whatnot, but um, like very limited. So um, yeah, I mean, in terms of body carbon and operational carbon, it's a, you know, a great, uh, a great story. Wonderful. Well, and, you know, listening to the owners, uh, the owner speak about the project too, you would never know that he had so many doubts during the process. So it seems <laughs> like at the end, he was quite happy. So, and willing to build another one too. So yeah. yeah. Well done. That's good. And that was before we had the uh, utility bills back. <laughs> <laughs> Even better now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Ken, are we at the... Yeah, we're good. I mean, if anybody has any other questions, yeah. we want to open it up. Uh, certainly. Yeah, feel free to speak but, up. But thank you, everybody. It's great to have this. And now we can appreciate how easy we've got it. <laughs> we're in the warmer climate <laughs> climates, yeah. Yeah, well, the, I think that the next one was going to be in BC. He's potentially got one coming up there, and then oh, not quite as cold a climate. Yeah, I mean, interior on the coast. Is, on the coast, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so it'd be uh, a bit easier on that. And we we've done it before, so we'd be optimizing it, right? Yeah. Fabulous. It's great to see. All right. Thank you, everybody.